My name is Kathleen Winters, and I'm the executive director for the Northern District Historical Society. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in person and virtually. Um, special thanks to all of our co-sponsors, to UC School of Law, and to Katchet Petrie McCarthy for hosting us in this beautiful space. Um, we're also grateful for the technical support provided by the law school and David Karp of Access Video. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Historical Society Board Member Nancy Nishimura, who will begin tonight's discussion. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Nancy Nishimura, along with my board members and colleagues, Raymond Rowland, Michael Abraham, Charles Reichman, and the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society member, Robin Lipsky. She's hiding in the back there. You, you know, some of you may remember being taught that America is a melting pot. Well, if you know of Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the 60s, he became a very well-regarded senator, and he wrote a book, The Myth of the Melting Pot, and that is why we're here. We're here to talk about a case study, what happened to the Asians in America, because we are not a melting pot. And this case study is a continuing program from the Northern District Historical Society, and in December of 2022, we did the program called California's Extermination of the Native Americans, or Extermination Against American Indians. And one of our friends, UCLA professor Benjamin Madley, along with some noted members of the various tribes in Northern California, uh, were speakers. And Professor Madley wrote this devastating book called An American Genocide. And in this book, he outlines how Native Americans were literally killed for their land. What happens today that we're going to talk about could happen again. And, and the purpose of this program today is to learn about history, to think about what happened, and to remember to vote. Because we are facing times now where we've been told this could happen again and it can happen again, and we have to remember to vote. No matter what your, what your political persuasion is, just get out and vote. Now, everything we're doing today, including this program and the bios of our panelists, will be posted on the Northern District Historical Society website. So if we don't get into detail on everyone's bios, because that could take us the entirety of this program, um, you can read about them on the website. Part one, this, this program will be in three parts. Part one will cover the 19th century, and Professor Gordon Chang, on sabbatical from Stanford, is going to join us via Zoom from the beautiful Huntington Library in Pasadena. And he's going to tell us about Chinese immigration in the 19th century and how they built railroads and really made the infrastructure of America what it is. My friend and historian David Lay, an activist, will, will follow him and talk about what the Chinese did to try to enforce their rights and all the litigation they brought in the 19th century. Then we switch to part two. In part two, Professor Meredith from Berkeley, Michael Omi, will tell us that the United States pivoted because the Chinese then became allies. So what? What did the Americans do? They turned against the Japanese. Our friend Neil Ruiz from the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C. is allowing us to use excerpts from their documentary, Being Asian in America. And we are going to hear the voices of two women who grew up in the internment camp, including my mother. Part three, we will be greeted by City Attorney David Chu and then my colleague, Raymond Rowland, will take over, and he's going to interview three panelists on what we're doing in the 21st century. One of our colleagues, Quinn Ta, is a, the, a, a lawyer extraordinaire, but she's going to be speaking about her pro bono work and her leadership of the 
Alliance for Asian American Justice. Varna Ranlett, my friend, is the CEO and founder of Leaders Forum. She will be talking about the Short Code Program. It's a grass tops organization. And our Vincent Pan, who's, who wears many hats, but today he's going to be here as one of the founding leaders of Stop Asian American Pacific Islander Hate. Um, the coalition is a grassroots organization fighting injustice here. But, but let me just switch a moment to say Jay Shu and my friends from the Asian Art Museum are here today because a museum, as we discuss, is not a warehouse of old things. We're here to learn history like we do at, at a museum. We're here to think about where we've come from and where we're going. And I want to remind all of you, learn, think, and vote. Professor Chang, you're going to tell us where we've come from. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, can you get a thank you for that introduction? And uh, you have a very rich program, so uh, there's a lot uh, that you have in store for you. What I wanted to say is that the history of Chinese in 19th century California is a very rich topic and one that is still uh, much to be uh, understood and discovered and researched. We really don't know a lot. Um, the, the traditional view of uh, California history, I grew up in the Oakland area, and uh, it's one of a, a history that is a continuation of the saga of manifest destiny of the populations from the East Coast coming out to California, to um, uh, which was a mythical land in the mid and late 19th century. Uh, and uh, it was a uh, land settled by white settlers from the East Coast, and it was personified by uh, leaders such as Leon Stanford, uh, the namesake, uh, the benefactor of my university, Stanford, or Alice Huntington, who helped, uh, whose wealth helped to found the great Huntington Library and Gardens down here in Southern California. Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, Chinese host a substantial portion of the state and were responsible for much of the construction of the state. In the 17 and 1870s uh, and 1880s, it's estimated the Chinese uh, composed approximately 20-25% of the working population of California. And yet their contributions to California's uh, you know, development have still underappreciated or even uh, uh, neglected and ignored entirely. Uh, what I wanted to show with you today is some slides of their work on the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, and this, the pictures show uh, the, the Chinese at work in the high Sierra. We have immense slow snow up in the Sierra, and many of you, I'm sure, have been up in the Sierra. Uh, you've gone up to Donner Summit, so you can look at Donner Lake, you go to Truckee. Uh, and you know, sometimes you can look out if you're on Interstate 80 and you look out and you can see the railroad line snaking alongside Interstate 80. And I'd like to ask you to think about what, it, what do you think that line is? I mean, that's the uh, still in use uh, portion of the California portion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And what was constructed by you know, Chinese labor by and large, 90% of the Chinese labor force on the Central Pacific Railroad, the railroad line responsible for the western portion of the Czech metal. Uh, it was, uh, was, was headed by Stanford and Crawford, Hopkins, and Huntington, uh, and 90% of their labor force, uh, which started out from Sacramento, went all the way to uh, Salt Lake City, was Chinese. Uh, it was an, an immense, incredible accomplishment, the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. The ferry was constructed, it would take six to eight weeks, uh, approximately, maybe more, to get from one coast to the other coast, from San Francisco to New York, or, or from New York to San Francisco. California was cut off from the rest of the country. And the long distances of the terrain, the difficulty of travel, and the hostility the travelers would face uh, going through uh, Native American country and the plains. After the railroad was constructed, it would take six to eight days to go from one side to the other side. Uh, and uh, the uh, the railroad uh, transformed the country. It transformed and made possible the transformation uh, from, of, of California. Uh, 
Now, the ways one would go from one coast to the other, it's, it's legendary. And to take a ship from New York Harbor, <clears throat> go all the way down past the tip of South America and come all the way up on the Pacific side. Where you take the same ship, you get off on the east coast of Panama, walk, get across Panama Isthmus, take another ship all the way up. The third route, which was the common, which was a common route, which was to go out to Chicago or get out to Omaha, Nebraska, and then basically walk the rest of the way. We travel it's difficult, dangerous, expensive. Um, but then after the construction of the trans Railroad, Railroad, uh, it, it was uh, relatively safe, much cheaper, and was able to transport people, goods, commodities, uh, newspapers, and information back and forth. Uh, now, what happens to these Chinese workers who are on the Chinese, uh, who are on the railroad? And he estimated approximately 25, I say, we did a project to recover the history of the Chinese railroad workers. We did this and they worked for seven, eight years at Stanford in recovering um, this history, which was uh, unprecedented uh, in its richness of research. We estimated about 20,000 Chinese uh, and worked on the Transcontinental Railroad through, through uh, well, from 1864 to 1869. Uh, the most difficult work was to get through the Sierra. As I mentioned before, you try to imagine working, living, working, and getting a railroad line through the Sierra with those in, those towering cliffs and granite uh, uh, mountains. Uh, but the Chinese did so, uh, and they got to tell, uh, through the tunnel, tunnel through through the Sierra, uh, and uh, um, uh, got the railroad line through the Sierra. But what was uh, what was their uh, what was what was their reward? If you could say that for doing such a monumental work, uh, they received great honor by railroad barons, by many other landowners, the owners, and in, in the capitals of California and others who uh, uh, saluted the Chinese for the industry, hard work, dedication, sacrifice. The contribution to the welfare of the state. And others saw the Chinese as labor competitors, as racial inferiors, as those that were undesirable uh, in the state, and became the target of virulent anti Chinese violence. Uh, it, 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 it had started almost from the beginning of when Chinese began to enter the state in the 1850s, but soared through the 1870s and 1880s. As the, child, as the population in the state increased, more European immigrants came into the state and believed the Chinese were undesirable and um, uh, were, uh, what to remove them from the state. Hundreds of Chinese were brutally murdered. Uh, scores of local, state, and federal uh, uh, acts were passed to harass them and to try to exclude them from the country altogether, which did result in the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, and the Chinese were were uh, almost uh, completely eliminated from the shores, uh, from the lands of the United States. So instead of receiving the honor they should have received, is uh, just helping to build uh, the, the country, they received uh, you know, vile uh, hatred uh, and uh, uh, violence. We actually probably should start winding up here, uh, but I would say... Uh, just to bring it up to your our present, is that this history is important for a number of different reasons. Why it's important because it is part of our history. It's an unfortunate part of our history, and it's also very important for many uh, the population today, including Chinese Americans who are proud of that history, who believe it must be acknowledged and recognized and celebrated and honored as part of our multicultural history. Yes. It was also a sober reminding. Now, the historical antecedents to the anti Asian violence that we saw during COVID. Uh, the important thing, and I'm working on a long history of anti Asian violence myself this year, but the important thing is to remember that the anti Chinese, anti Asian violence we saw during COVID uh, was not an anomaly. It was not just uh, haphazard or random, but actually the the result, a continuation of, a manifestation of the long history, ugly history of anti-Chinese and anti 
Asian sentiment. So with that, I think I'll stop there. I, I hope that you have a very rich and rewarding and useful discussion. And then, you know, Professor Chang. Okay, well, again, um, I wish you the best in your conference uh, today. We, we, Thank you very much. David. All right. So David Lay is a historian and activist here in San Francisco, and he's going to tell us about the historical precedents of all of the litigation brought by the Chinese in the 19th century. Thank you, Nancy. I have to say I'm a bit nervous. I have to admit this because I've, I'm not a lawyer. I've not taken a single law class, and here I am going to talk about Supreme Court cases with a group, an audience of distinguished judges and lawyers. Now, someone else is probably more nervous than I am, and that's Nancy Nishimura, because she is the one that invited me, and I told her, this was like bringing coal to Newcastle, and very poor quality coal at that. But Nancy, don't worry, because I've been watching CNN the last month or so, I've been watching all these Trump cases, so I think I know something about the law and how the court works now. So let's go ahead. My talk is uh, the most litigious and civil disobedient Americans, because it's Chinese Americans. And we usually do not have that, uh, that kind of branding. Where Asian Americans are thought of, of, of being very quiet and complain. But uh, I'm going to talk about several cases. So, all this really got started officially 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's the first time in America that uh, Congress passed uh, legislation saying if you're Chinese, you cannot come here. The exceptions were if you are a diplomat, you're a scholar, or you're a merchant, because this country still wants to do business with China. So with the, these few exceptions, you cannot come. And if you happen to be already here, you are ineligible to be a citizen. Uh, so you can never be a naturalized citizen starting in 1882. So this was an important act, the first time the U.S. did this. Prior to this, everyone can come in, didn't need an immigration naturalization department because everyone can just walk in. Here are some of the cases uh, that the Chinese brought. After the Exclusion Act until 1905, more than 10,000 cases were brought up to the federal courts by the Chinese. There were only 105,000 Chinese in America in 1882. So this is almost 10% of the Chinese hire a white lawyers because Chinese could not be lawyers in those days. So they spent good money and sued the federal government, not counting the state government, municipal government, and uh, county government. So these are some of the more important cases, and many of them are Supreme Court cases. And out of these 10,000 cases, about 20, a little more than 20, went to the Supreme Court. And giving to all Americans right to a public education, even if you're an immigrant, in fact, even if you're an illegal immigrant, equal protection under the law, uh, this is uh, beyond the 14th Amendment, which everybody thought the law had to be written equal. When the Chinese brought this case, it was the administration and the execution of the law had to be equal. When we have civil disobedience, I'll show you later uh, the largest incidents of civil disobedience in this country. Uh, birthright citizenship, what makes you an American? As a Chinese case, political asylum, the concept of political asylum, the first time this country thought about it is a Chinese case. Uh, Miranda Act is actually based on a Chinese case in 1924. Uh, 
that case was in D.C., so it only applied to federal jurisdiction. When Miranda came, they took that case and made it applicable to all the other jurisdictions. In bilingual education, as recently as 1974, brought on by Chinese for Affirmative Action, and we have Vincent Pan here from the Chinese for Affirmative Action. So uh, these are the main case, and I'll go into detail a bit at a time. The first one is Right to a Public Education, 1885, Tate versus Early. So this is the Tate family. They were upper middle class. They were Christians. They spoke English. And they had a lot of uh, Anglo-American friends. So they felt their daughters in the middle of their Mimi should go to a public school. And when they showed up, Mrs. Hurley, the principal, says, oh, no, we don't accept Orientals in our school. So like any good American, they sued. They sued the uh, school district, and it went to the state Supreme Court. And they won in 1885 saying, if you are under the jurisdiction of the state, you pay your taxes, your fee, you don't break the law, then you should get the benefit of the state, So, which include a public education. So they won, but Mimi never went to public school here because she didn't get her shots yet, her immunization shots. So Mrs. Hurley said, you come back next year. In the meantime, the Board of Education started a Oriental school. So separate but equal started here in San Francisco. This is one of the most important cases, and many of you should have read about this case going through this case going through law school. Yick Wall versus Hopkins, 1886. Uh, I was giving a talk about this with uh, Charles McLean. I'm not sure anyone knows Charles McLean right here. He was a professor at Berkeley, and he wrote all these Asian American law cases with uh, two other people, a Robert Kim in uh, Western Washington University. And this is an important case because we know 14th Amendment has a clause, equal protection under law. And the Chinese could no longer come in 1882. But here in San Francisco, the Board of Supervisors thought we had a problem here because about 15% of the population were Chinese American in 1885. So they said, how can we get rid of the Chinese that's already here? So they looked around and said, wow, all the laundries the Chinese work at or they own. So they said, if we got rid of the laundries, maybe the Chinese will have no means of livelihood and will return to China. So they pass a new legislation for a laundry. You need a permit. And they will send the fire department there to make sure you know how to boil water safely so you don't burn down the whole city. This was very important. San Francisco was maybe 99% built out of wood, and they would have a fire every decade and wipe out the city. So this is a good law. So 320 laundries immediately apply for the permit. 100 got it, 220 rejected. Maybe the 220 did not know how to boil water safely. The problem was all 100 were white, and the 220 were Chinese. So they figure they're the Board of Supervisors just trying to get rid of us. So they hired the best lawyer money could buy in 1885. We have a statue of him on McAllister Street. We now have two statues in front of City Hall. One is Lincoln on the Polk Street side. And on the McAllister Street side, we have Hall McAllister, the founder of the California Bar Association. Very few people notice him there. But the Chinese hired him, raised $20,000, equivalent to half a million dollars today. And he took the case all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, one Chinese named Li Yik, he 
operated without the license to test the case. He went to jail, was fined, refused to pay the fine. So it was a habeas corpus case. So it went to the Supreme Court and the Chinese won, saying the 14th Amendment means not only that the law has to be written equal for everybody, and more importantly, the execution and the administration of the law has to be equal. So the Chinese want this uh, for all Americans. This is what we believe in, if we believe in civil rights. This is a case, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act had to be renewed every 10 years. It was only good for 10 years. So in 1892, we have the Gary Act to renew the Chinese Exclusion Act. But they added another a requirement that every Chinese here must carry a internal passport to show that they are legal, legally here. And if they're caught without it, found without it, they have to serve one year of hard labor before they're deported. I don't understand the part about the hard labor. Why don't you just deport them? But you have to serve one year of hard labor before you de get deported. So the Chinese Six Company, equivalent to the City Hall for Chinatown, said, well, in America, only dogs need to carry around with them a license all the time to show who they are. And only criminals need to register with a state. And we Chinese are not dogs and we're not criminals. So why should we do this? So they told the Chinese population, don't go and register and we're going to sue the federal government. Uh, this is the Fong Yuting case. Uh, so 97% of the Chinese, approximately 100,000, refused to register and sue the federal government. But the Chinese lost. So had to register. So if you see these uh, certificate of uh, residency, they're always 1894, uh, after they lost the case. They were supposed to register 1892 and 1893. It was very rare to find one, 1892 and 93. So this is the largest incidence of long-term civil disobedience in the U.S. and the Chinese did this. What makes you an American? Being born here seems very simple. The 14th Amendment stated this after the Civil War. But for the Chinese, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the question was, this guy Wong Kim Art, a cook, about 24, 25 years ago, he was born in the United States, so he should be a, an American citizen. He went back to China. And when he returned, U.S. immigration says, oh, no, you're Chinese. And he cannot come in. He said, but I'm born here. 14th Amendment says I can come in. And they said, well, your parents are immigrants, and they are ineligible to be citizens, according to the Exclusion Act. So we're going to test this. Uh, can a child born a parent's that are ineligible to be citizen, be a citizen at birth. So the Chinese Six Company raised money again, tax all the Chinese a dollar, and hire the former attorney general of the U.S., one of the co-founder of the American Bar Association, and took this case to the Supreme Court and won once and for all. If you're born here, you are a U.S. citizen. I think the only exception, if you are a child of an invading force that happened to be in the U.S., you're not a citizen if you're a child of an invading force. But uh, I think this issue is coming up again. But the Chinese went through this and pay the best lawyers to make sure if you're born here, you're a citizen. And only about 35, six countries around the world recognize this. It's not, you don't find this in Europe or in Asia or uh, other parts of the world except in the Americas. It's a political asylum. In 1916, Pancho Villa came across the border 
and killed a few Americans. Woodrow Wilson, the president, said, we can't let Mexico do this. And so got uh, John Pershing, General John Pershing, in 1916 with 10,000 soldiers to go into Mexico to capture Pancho Villa. At that time, the U.S. never sent such a large force anywhere, so it did not have a quartermaster corps. The quartermaster corps takes care of the soldier while they're fighting. So they feed the soldier, they cook, they set up tent, they move equipment around. So the U.S. military took out an ad in the paper in Mexico looking for people to take care of the soldier. Needed 1,000. Of course, the Mexicans will not did not want to help an invading force, so they didn't sign up. But the Chinese in Mexico said, wow, 20 cents an hour, let's go and sign up. So about 1,000 Chinese sign up. Persia went around Mexico for a whole year, unable to capture Pancho Villa. In the meantime, World War I started in Europe. Persian was the only general that had this few experience, so Woodrow Wilson recalled him back to U.S. to go to Europe. On his way back, he brought the Americans that were stuck in Mexico, the Mormons who were being massacred by the Mexicans at the time, and 700 Chinese that helped him and his soldiers in Mexico. So when they got to the border, everybody could cross. The Chinese had a problem, the Chinese Exclusion Act. So the Chinese weren't allowed to come in. Purging to his credit, with his 10,000 soldier, pushed the dozen immigration officials aside and brought the Chinese into America, but they had to stay at Fort Sam Houston because now they're illegal. Pershing went to Europe, won World War I, came back a, as a hero, and he found out the Chinese were still stuck there at Fort Sam Houston and the military's paying for their upkeep. He says, no, this can't, we can't have this, especially during time of war, if people help us, we must take care of them. So he went to Congress in 1921 and passed Public Law 29. First time this country thought about political asylum. Miranda Act. We all think this is uh, Hispanic. Miranda, 1966 Supreme Court case. It's based on a case Jiangsu Wan in 1924, Supreme Court case, murder case in D.C., where the defendants, two Chinese, were tortured, denied representation, and the Supreme Court decided you cannot do this because during the trial they recanted. They said, we confessed because we were tortured. So that case was uh, settled in 1924, but uh, when Miranda came, but the problem was it was a D.C. case, a uh, federal jurisdiction only. So when Miranda came about, they just took this Chinese case and applied to the other jurisdiction, state, municipality, county, and so on. So this case is really based on this uh, Chinese case in D.C. Then finally, in 1972, bilingual education all of a sudden, we have the Immigration Naturalization Act of 1965. The quota for Chinese to come to America from 1943, when the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed, until 1965, only 105 Chinese are allowed to come to this country a year. After the passage of the Civil Rights Act, Johnson says, well, if we believe everyone is equal, why do we have these uh, quotas that's unjust? So he changed it all the way uh, instantly to 20000 a year that started in 1968. So also we have all these immigrants coming in, including students, and they were being taught math, science, history, political science in English. And they don't understand a word of English. So the parents in Chinatown went to Chinese for Affirmative Action and sued the Board of Education, went to the Supreme Court, and the Chinese won. So today, if you have enough students in your school district that do not speak English, then you must have bilingual education. 
and a share, share. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, David. And, and as you can tell, uh, for those of you who need continuing legal education, you can thank David for that. <laughs> Professor Michael Omi, so then what happened? The Chinese Exclusion Act is repealed in 1943. Why then do, does the United States turn against the Japanese? Thank you, Nancy. First of all, um, that was great, David. I think it was really important to highlight the centrality of Asians, particularly Chinese, in, in sort of these uh, debates, both legalistic and about challenging constitutional law, because we don't think about that often. And I think that's very important. Um, there is continuity, but there's discontinuity in the anti-Asian representations of Chinese and Japanese in the U.S. Uh, in 1941, Life magazine presented anthropomorphic data and photos in an article entitled How to Tell Japs from Chinese so that readers might better distinguish allies from the enemy. At the turn of the century, China was regarded as a weak nation, while Japan was seen as a rising nation with a strong state, particularly after Japan's victory over Tsarist Russia in the Russo-Japanese Wars between 1904 and 1905. Fears now of the yellow peril or become magnified during the First and Second World Wars. Now, there's a vast literature, and many of you are familiar with it, I'm sure, about uh, what happened to the Japanese during World War II. But many of these narratives tend to start with the bombing of Pearl Harbor and then talking about what exactly happened to Japanese on the West Coast of the United States. And uh, my intention today um, is going to focus on kind of two related points. First of all, that um, I'm going to argue that the decision really to remove and incarcerate Japanese Americans was not simply due to war hysteria in the immediate wake of Pearl Harbor, but the product of well over a half a century of anti-Japanese sentiments. And related to that is that long-standing racial ideas and beliefs profoundly shaped discriminatory laws, policies, and practices that paved the way for the tragedy of the camps. In 1905, the San Francisco Chronicle headlines boldly stated, the Japanese invasion, the problem of the hour. The paper insisted that the Japanese were a menace to American, that is white women, and that quote, every one of these immigrants is a Japanese spy, end of quote. Now I point that out because this representation of Japanese as spies gets well established in the popular imagination at least 35 years before the attack on Pearl Harbor. A little more than a week after these headlines appeared, both houses of the California State Legislature unanimously passed a resolution asking Congress to limit or exclude the further Im immigration of Japanese. And for the next 40 years, Every session of the California State Legislature is, at, is, is able to pass at least one piece of anti-Japanese legislation. Among other things, Japanese ambitions to own or um, lease small tracts of land, of farmland, were seen as incompatible with a system of land monopolies and the maintenance of a large pool of Japanese as low-wage migrant labor. In 1910, California Labor Commissioner John McKenzie said, Japanese ambition is to progress beyond mere servility. The moment that this ambition is exercised, that moment the Japanese ceases to become an ideal laborer. Well, my emphasis tonight is going to be on racial ideology. Race is always complexly connected to class, gender, and sexuality. The political appeals illustrate how these categories tend to blend together. In 1913, the California State Legislature was debating whether to pass an alien land law. And one of the people who testified was a man named Ralph Newman. And this is what he had to say. Over my home is an 80-acre tract of as fine a land as there is in California. 
on that track lives a Japanese. Let that Japanese lives a white woman. In that woman's arms is a baby. What is that baby? It isn't Japanese. It isn't white. It is a germ of the mightiest problem that ever faced this state, a problem that will make the black problem of the South look white. And certainly such emotional pleas, uh, pleas such as this help assure passage of the law. I also want to say that there is a through line because many of these kinds of anti-Asian restrictions are done in the shadows of, of, of you know, of, in, in after the Civil War, in which the, the black problem and the problem of slavery and the uh, tremendous sort of uh, racial repercussions of that still resonate among the population. Now, there's a lot of laws I could focus on, but I'm going to talk uh, just briefly on the alien land law. Now, under the alien land law of 1913, which Ralph Newman testified about, aliens and eligibles for citizenship could not own land or lease it for periods longer than three years. And it was specifically aimed at Japanese farm growers. Now, interestingly, oops, did I pass that? Interestingly, the law did not have a dramatic effect. Attorney generals didn't enforce the law strenuously during World War I, given the nation's need for food production. But once the war was over, a new campaign was mounted by anti-Japanese forces to close loopholes in the original law. The 1920 law ended the ability to, of aliens ineligible for citizenship to lease farmland altogether. It forbade them to purchase land in the name of their American-born minor children. It also prohibited them from purchasing land through corporations in which they held more than 50% of the stock shares. Now, while the California law stayed on the books until 1956, it was ruled unconstitutional in 1952 by the California Supreme Court during the uh, citing a violation of the 14th Amendment in the Fuji E versus California case. Just to draw a line to the contemporary period, too, that there was a number of other states that passed alien land laws throughout much of the 20th century. And sadly, a new alien land law is in effect in Florida and in Texas and at least seven other states. It's kind of a curious, ironic one. I'm just going to take an aside here. Uh, it was on the Florida books, the earlier laws, until it was rescinded in 2018. And now Florida has a new alien land law. I want to also draw attention, and these are mainly, you know, sort of bulleted points, really, to the fact that many of the racist exclusionary policies were being validated and legitimated by scientific writing emerging from the academic community. And this is important to note because I think there's a tendency for us to think about anti-racism, anti-Asian racism, as sort of the hysterical product of opportunistic politicians an unenlightened working class, and nativistic ideologues. But the important thing is that academic scholars were very deeply involved and complicit as well. And I'm going to draw on one of the founding fathers of my discipline, sociology, a man named Edward Ellsworth Ross. Um, in fact, this quote from Ross and his picture come from the American Sociological Society's website, Association's website. Um, Ross was a prolific writer, best known for his book, Social Control, which outlined the needs and methods for solving social problems and political turmoil in the United States. He, he was a complex guy. He was a progressive for, a reformer who really criticized the ills of industrial capitalism. And he also was a eugenicist, as was Stanford President David Starr Jordan, who actively recruited him to Stanford. Here's a lot of those guys at Stanford, by the way. <laughs> Ross argued that immigrants, Asiatic immigrants, as he called them, possessed a special race vitality, which coupled with their different culture and their low standard of living, presented a threat to white labor and needed to be banned from entering the country. Ross considered it a fatal weakness. Oops, let me hit that again. 
can go back. I can't go back. Okay. Who else considered it? I'm sorry. Will that go off? There you go. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> Ross considered it a fatal weakness when a race comes to compete industrially with a capable race that multiplies on a lower plane. And if left unchecked, Asiatics would go on unopposed until they monopolized all industrial occupations. Americans, Ross thought, would, quote, shrink to a superior caste and retain their political position in government, education, finance, and the direction of industry, but they, in fact, would be hopelessly beaten and displaced as a race. And this, along with some other trend lines he was examining, to Ross, was race suicide. Now, to prevent this, Ross believed the importance of direct intervention in the form of strong Asian exclusion legislation. In May 1900, James Phelan was running for mayor in the city of San Francisco, and he helped organize this very large anti-immigration rally. And he invited Stanford Professor Ross, who turned out to be one of the most powerful voices at the rally. Now said at that rally in 1900, and should worse come to worse, it would be better for us to turn our guns on every vessel bringing Japanese to our shores rather than permit them to land. And as we know, um, the U.S. did, in fact, institute very rigid immigration restrictions, which for the most part, uh, for most Asians, and David could attest to as well, remained in place until the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. Japanese immigrants remained aliens ineligible for citizenship until the passage of the McCarran-Walter Act in 1952. And this is an interesting disjuncture here, too. The Chinese were able to become naturalized citizens um, in the, with the repeal of the Chinese exclusion laws in 1943. So it would be nine years after and after World War II before the Japanese could become naturalized citizens of the United States. Asians are often suspiciously regarded as perpetual foreigners whose assimilability and loyalty to the United States um, was questionable and suspect. Takao Ozawa in the United States, uh, Ozawa versus the United States in 1922, was denied the privileges of naturalization because he was considered racially not white, regardless of demonstrated acculturation and social integration. The notion of a race that cannot assimilate is a prevalent theme. Here's Woodrow Wilson on the campaign trail for president in 1912. Um, and, and, you know, Wilson was an exclusionist. He stood for a policy of exclusion. He says the whole question of assimilation is one of diverse races. We cannot make a homogeneous population of a people who do not blend with the Caucasian race. Ionoculism will give us another race problem to solve, and surely we have learned our lesson. Think about that, and let's fast forward 30 years, right? And here we are uh, in the midst of um, a, a Second World War, and this is a quote from General John DeWitt, the military commander of the Western Defense Command, who, following the issuance of President Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066, is charged with carrying out the removal of Japanese Americans on the West Coast. To which says, the Japanese race is an enemy race, and while many second and third generation Japanese born on the United States soil, possessed of United States citizenship, have become Americanized, the racial strains are undiluted. Right. Contrast his remarks to, uh, with regards to what he said about other nationalities. And I'll just quote this. Um, a few months after that quote, DeWitt says, you needn't worry about the Italians at all, except in certain cases. Also, the same for the Germans, except in individual cases. But we must worry about the Japanese all the time until he's wiped off the map. At the close of the war, now, Jean Rostow, the noted legal scholar who had subsequently become dean of the Yale Law School, uh, 
wrote the following. He said, 100,000 persons were sent to concentration camps on a record which wouldn't support a conviction for stealing a dog. She's right. But aside from the question of legality, the point I want to emphasize this, uh, this evening is the role of racial ideology disseminated over the course of decades that have been really instrumental in shaping the tragic outcomes of the camps. Thank you. So let me just follow on P Professor Ormi. Thank you very much. On February 19, 1942, the anniversary was last week, Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. Within 10 days, General DeWitt effectuated 9066 and removed 125,284, two-thirds of whom were American citizens. These were Americans of Japanese descent. They were moved within a week, you're going to hear two people, to horse stalls. They lost their liberty. They lost their property. Most of them did not lose their dignity, however, but they lived in horse stalls until the barracks were built, and they had to stay there for years. And we are going to see, thanks to the Pew Research Center, um, an excerpt of two survivors of the camps, Janaoki Burke and Toki Konishimura. Uh, I was uh, nine years old at the time, and um, we, my sister and I were coming home from a movie theater, walking down um, Beverly Boulevard, and um, she started noticing signs on the telephone posts. So we stopped and read the signs, and it says, notice all Japanese Americans in this area have to be out of this area by uh, a certain date. It was about a week. We just saw signs on the wall, you know, on, at the store and everything. The people at the store used to say, hey, we're going to be evacuated. And so I think my parents got a phone call from someone saying that you have to uh, get rid of everything. You're going to have to leave home. So a lot of things we had to bury because, like I said, the FBI was looking for something to connect us with uh, Japan. So we had some kimono because we used to dance. So we had to bury all that. It was a shock, you know. I know my parents had a hard time. And so it was, they just gave us uh, three, four days to prepare to leave. Then they were looking for my father because we lived in front of the judo. And so they thought that my, my father was affiliated with someone from Japan. And so they thought that he was an enemy alien. We were in Santa Anita for five months while they built these relocation centers inland. Santa Anita, the racetrack, we showered where the horses shower. So it, it, there was a ply board in the middle of the room. Half of the room was for women and the other half was for men. So there's no privacy at all. So we went to rural Arkansas from Santa Anita we couldn't go out of camp because there's barbed wires around the camp and the soldiers in the guard towers with the, with the guns so that they assured the neighborhood surrounding the camps, don't worry, the Japanese won't escape because if they try to escape, we'll sh shoot them on the spot. We went to Heart Mountain. And so in order to go from assembly center to Heart Mountain, it's more like a concentration camp. If, if you try to sneak out anywhere, they'll just shoot at you. We were so ashamed of being in prison that we never talked about it. So my kids didn't know anything about evacuation or being in camp. I used to say, gee, I wish I was a blonde with blue eyes. I used to always, I uh, think of myself, gee, if I wasn't, you know, brown-eyed and black hair, this wouldn't have happened. And 
I won't be discriminated against all the time. And then I thought about it after I grew up, and I said, you know, I should be proud of what I am, and I'm happy to be what I am now. Good evening. I am sorry that my schedule keeps me away, but my son was born on leap day, and while he is biologically eight years old, tonight is his second actual birthday. But I'm happy to be asked to kick off this panel since it's so important. I want to thank the Northern District Court and the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Societies, as well as the sponsoring organizations. I wish I could be with you because I've worked closely and love your amazing moderators and panelists. Hey, Nancy, Ray, Quinn, Lorna, and Vin. My guess is many of you in this room have a deep connection to the topic of anti-Asian hate. I wouldn't be where I am today but for an incident my freshman year in college, when eight Asian students at a nearby school were attacked because of their race, which sent me down this path to activism, law school, and elected office. Fast forward, I think about the fact that the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and the California State Legislature, where I served in, were once the legislative bodies that passed the anti-Asian laws of the 19th and 20th centuries. As San Francisco's first Asian city attorney, I think about the fact that Asian Americans who experienced hate in the Northern District over a century ago were parties to lawsuits that established fundamental civil rights for our community. Yik Wo's right to run a laundry, Mamie Tape's right to education, Wong Kim Ark's right to birthright citizenship. Now it's hard to imagine four years ago this month marks the beginning of the most recent spike of anti-Asian hate. I want to thank so many of you who worked so hard to track, protest, and organize against hate who worked with me and our legislature to pass the $166 million statewide API equity budget, the largest investment of its kind in the country, who partnered with my office and our San Francisco Police Department, district attorney, and elected official clients to establish a comprehensive citywide response protocol to address hate. Because of your work, we have seen a real drop in hate incidents. But our work is not done. Tonight's forum is so important because we must reflect on that recent history so we never forget that history or repeat it. Thanks again to the Northern District of California Historical Society for supporting that history. Know you have a partner in me and our office. And if we do our jobs right, my hope is when my son Lucas goes to college, he'll read about anti-Asian hate in the history books, not in the daily newspapers. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good evening. Attacks on the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities escalated sharply after the coronavirus first appeared in late 2019. From March 2020 to September 2021, more than 10,000 hate incidents against the Asian community were reported to the Stop AAPI Hate Coalition. These hate incidents involved shunning, racist taunting, and physical assaults resulting in senseless deaths. In response, AAPI groups mobilized their own communities and formed coalitions with other marginalized groups with the goal of urging leaders and industries to act. From hosting local fundraisers to rallies, to changing school policies, to advancing national legislation, AAPI communities and allies are developing solutions to increase visibility and to fight against racism, xenophobia, and violence. Our panelists this evening are esteemed community leaders and advocates who have been at the front lines of movements seeking to address anti-Asian discrimination locally, statewide, and nationally. We will be discussing the contemporary resurgence of anti-Asian hate crimes and prejudice, current efforts being undertaken to tackle these issues and finally, ways we can all be involved in the fight for racial justice and equity. Clint Ta is a partner at the King and Spalding Law Firm, 
where she focuses on high stakes business disputes. Klein is a founder of the Alliance for Asian American Justice, which brings together Asian American Fortune 1000 general counsel and law firm partners to join forces to offer pro bono legal services to victims of anti-Asian hate. Lorna Ranlett is the CEO and founder of the Leaders Forum, a C-suite Asian American Pacific Islander executive think tank engaged in public policy. Lorna is a commissioner for the White House Initiative for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders. And last but not least, Vincent Pan is a co-executive director of Chinese for Affirmative Action, a community-based civil rights organization in San Francisco committed to social justice and multiracial democracy. CAA is one of, of the founding partners of the National Stop AAPI Hate Movement. And Vincent also serves as co-chair of the Center for Asian American Media Board and is a founding leader of the Asian Americans for Civil Rights and Equality Network. Welcome, Quinn, Lorna, and Vincent. Lorna, my first question is addressed to you. Earlier in the program, we discussed the historical and legal underpinnings of anti-Asian discrimination in the United States. Why do you think that the AAPI community is experiencing such a resurgence of violence and discrimination post-COVID? Erin, thank you so much. And I'd like to obviously thank um, the Northern Historic District as well as Nancy um, and all the rest of the panel for having us. Um, I, I, I don't think that it's a mystery why the resurgence is happening. Um, we heard from our previous speakers that when people in authoritative positions make damaging statements on behalf of race, it goes a long way. Um, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, I think it's pretty obvious that when you have the sitting president of the United States, then Donald Trump, saying things in a public rally like Chinese virus and Kung flu um, and encouraging white supremacy in that context uh, within a national crisis, a global crisis that had to do with health. It really was the spark that, that set everything off and it empowered, you know, people who wanted to blame and, and look for, um, somebody to victimize, and it gave them license to do it. And I think it was extremely damaging. Thank you. Vincent, in the work that you've done with Stop AAPI Hate, in what ways have you seen anti-Asian sentiment manifest? And how have anti-Asian incidents, rhetoric, and policies harmed and continue to harm the AAPI community? Sure. So, um, oh. At CA, when we created Stop API Hate, it was actually before the first case of COVID-19 had, uh, had actually even arrived in the United States. Um, and along with the API Equity Alliance in Los Angeles and the Asian American Studies Department at San Francisco State, we could see what was coming. We could see what was coming because of the work of professors like Professor Chang and Professor Omi, that not only did we have an extremely racist uh, president but previously targeted Mexicans and Muslims and queer and trans people. Um, but we were in a period of, of relations between the United States and China that was bringing up again these old yellow peril, yellow peril hysteria fears, right? Now we had moved away from this period of so-called Chimerica and moving towards where we are now, this idea of decoupling, right? That somehow China is the existential threat. Right. And so that was really the context. And maybe former President Trump would have been very racist anyway, but it caught fire because of the, you know, the long buildup uh, of Chinese both as a perpetual foreigner, as well as China as part of this yellow peril of uh, hysteria. Um, so by creating Stop People I Hate, the first thing we wanted to do is try to break the silence and raise awareness and give community members a chance to share what was happening to them. We did this online, we did this in a dozen different languages, and about 11,000 people used our reporting site. And it's important to know that they reported knowing that we were not the police, we were not the government, we were not gonna show up and help them, right? They were reporting because they wanted to be part of a 
collective voice for change. And in this report, it's very important to understand that the 11,000 that we received really the tip of the iceberg, right? Because we're also doing, you know, larger surveys to get a bigger sample. The real number is closer to two, three million, right? But 11,000 people were telling us their stories in a qualitative way so we could understand what was actually happening. And so they were telling us people were using language like go back to China or you're part of the CCP, right? Not just Kung flu, not just Chinese virus, right? And that the type of hate that was occurring was largely the overwhelming majority were not criminal cases, right? And so that helped us understand that the uh, criminal uh, system would have its limits, right? A lot of this was the verbal shunning. It was a taunting. It was a bullying. It was workplace discrimination. It was being you know, denied service at a restaurant. Things that if people called the police, the police would not have tools to be able to address. So that leads us to solutions that need to get business involved, needs to get civil rights departments involved, needs to uh, advance ethnic studies, um, you know, uh, um, you know, a healthier climate campus. But I would say where we are still very, very um, uh, under-mobilized is on the larger threat of what yellow peril uh, hysteria does. Right? And that's one of the key lessons we need to learn from history, right? And so as much as we need to mitigate how these harms can, uh, uh, how these harms are happening, and prevent them. There are now about 30 states who have introduced or passed some version of an alien land ban, right? Uh, Professor Omi mentioned Florida, where along with the ACLU, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund are fighting that. Uh, there keeps uh, kind of different versions of SB 47 in Texas that would ban the ability of Chinese immigrants and others. Uh, you see the China Initiative, which targeted Chinese um, uh, American scientists and academics, there's a, a move to bring that back. Congress right now is considering bring, uh, continuing warrantless surveillance um, uh, that heavily targets Asian Americans who are in communication with family members overseas. And so I think that on, you know, although it's very, very hard and unfair to expect Asian Americans to necessarily weigh in on foreign policy, that's the dominant driver, right? And so when you listen to the Republican presidential debates, when you see what folks are saying on the campaign trail, it's China, China, China. It's Chinese TikTok. It's Chinese spy balloons. It's Chinese, you know, coming over the southern border. And that's fueling this hysteria that's going to be very, very difficult for us to be able to stop once it gets out of control. Thank you. And really, this notion of Asian Americans as being a perpetual foreigner in, a, in the U.S. has emboldened folks to commit violence against our community. Quinn, can you describe for us the landscape of this recent wave of attacks on the API community across the United States and including in San Francisco? Sure. So first, thank you, everyone, for having me. It's um, such an honor to be here and to be on the panel with um, Lorna and Ben, people I've long admired. So um, thank you. And Nancy, thank you for inviting us. Um, you know, so I'm not the expert on the statistics. I think Vin is, but obviously, um, and just to to correct the record, by the way, I'm not a founder of the Alliance for Asian American Justice. Um, to take a step back, the founders um, are Wilson Chu and Don Liu. The two of them together were thinking about this. And if, if those who attended NAPABA in, I think it was 2022, um, we talked a little bit about the history. Um, the two of them thought about, you know, all, this, all of us were sitting there, obviously, and we saw the, you know, the spike in hate crimes. And the two of them said, we need to do something. So they formed the Alliance for Asian American Justice and brought together the senior leadership of private practice and also um, general counsels of publicly traded companies. And so the other members um, at Gibson Dunn include um, Deborah Yang, um, Zakia Salim Williams, uh, Ty Park, Brian Sun, all these leaders came together and said, this is what we're doing. They launched it and then they reached out to all the AMLA partners um, across the country, myself included, we all signed up. So 90 plus um, and law firms signed up right away, not just Asian American lawyers, but those who are interested in parity and social justice. And then on top of that, the clients joined in the publicly traded company clients, 30 plus of them in the Fortune 1000 joined us. And so I joined that force, right? Um, but 
by the time that this all happened, I mean, look, you know, the statistics, because we studied it, we filed a complaint and, you know, I'll turn to like, then if you, you want to get more specific, but in San Francisco, it became an epi epicenter in some ways, right? Like what we saw was a, a spike of almost 600% increase in terms of hate crimes or violence. And that's reported against Asians, right? You know, there was like nine in 2020 at the beginning, it was like 60 in 2021. And that's reported. Because when I was out there sort of studying the issue, there were many senior citizens who were beat up and did not report. So I think that's even underreported. But in terms of the landscape itself, what we saw, at least on the Alliance side, when we got involved right away, was there were a lot of reports and we weren't sure what to do with it. In San Francisco, particularly since um, the cases that we worked on were here, what we heard about was, are these cases being prosecuted? Because, and I, you know, it kind of warmed my heart watching the presentations by the professors before us that the litigiousness of Chinese Americans. And to me, it's like, wear well, that as a badge of honor. We need to understand that being lawyers comes with a special obligation. And God bless us that, you know, Asian Americans can be lawyers now, right? That, but just, you know, what we saw then at the time was looking at the government and turning to the courts and ensuring that the government did their job. And so the problematic things that we saw particularly in San Francisco and other, um, and it's a, it's a complex, you know, story when you talk about sort of restorative justice and at the same time, victims' rights. But at the end of the day, for us, what we saw was that if you, there is a victim, you need to look into it. What happened? Crimes, you know, should be prosecuted. And obviously we look at the entire picture, right? But that was the problem that we saw was, were these cases being prosecuted? Because if the cases don't get prosecuted, then it's, there's a huge deterrent factor. Like when I spoke to certain ci senior citizens, because investigating these issues, some of the senior citizens said to us, why even report? Nothing's going to happen. It doesn't matter. But that same type of mentality is what leads to, you know, history repeating itself again and again and again and again, right? And so that was sort of the scene in which the alliance came. And in 20. 20 was when we joined and we started becoming active and I'll, you know, I'll, I know that you have a question later on about litigation and the role of it that I'll save for that. But that was sort of the scene and it was an inspiring scene too, because I think we all realized as Asian American lawyers and particularly those of us who represent corporations. I mean, I did it frankly, because I always wanted to be a civil rights lawyer, to be clear. I was at the Asian law caucus, but you know, growing up as a poor person, I need to pay my loans, Right. I got to private practice and it was like, look, and I clerked for a federal judge and I met all these other federal clerks and I realized, look, we are the ones with the money, with the power, with the training and the reps to do this work. And so that is how sort of we came about. And when we brought our lawsuit, I had 20 federal law clerks pouring over it. We spent over a million dollars in pro bono fees just on thinking about filing the complaint, right? We needed to make sure it didn't get dismissed and that it made, it sent a message. And so, you know, it was very poignant to me to hear about like, wow, they couldn't even get lawyers back then. And here we are now representing our community and ensuring that rights could be vindicated. So that's sort of the background for the Asian, uh, the Alliance for Asian American Justice. And thanks for the work that you do. Um, Vincent and Lorna, if you could share sort of the stories and anecdotes that you've uh, heard of Asian Americans experiencing violence. I know it happened all across the United States, from Atlanta to New York City, even to San in San Francisco. Um, could you share some of those stories? That that's fine. Sure. Um, sure. Well, let me let me take a step back and just share one point of perspective. The way in which our group is a little different than some of the work that um, these great folks are doing is we recognize, and, and I as a former commissioner on the White House Initiative for Asian American Pacific Islanders, recognize that we also have to bat to our strengths, right? We have been in America for a long time. <clears throat> and um, if you look at um, a lot of the top CEOs of America's big companies, CEO of Google and Alphabet, Asian American. CEO of Broadcom, Asian American. CEO of Advanced Micro Devices, Asian American. CEO of Zoom that everybody uses, Asian American. CEO of NVIDIA. Have you seen that stock price lately? 
Asian American, right? CEO of Microsoft, Adobe, former CEO of Pep Pepsi. It goes on and on. Part of what we focus on is that we are American and we deserve to be here. And we have all of these people who fought for all of these rights. So I think when we talk about what crimes we've heard that have happened, the poignant piece of it is it doesn't matter if you're one of these CEOs and you're walking down the street in the South and they don't know who you are and you could be attacked because you're Asian American. That's the key is that it could happen to anybody. And so part of why I think this discussion is so important is to say, as Americans, right, Asian Americans, but as Americans, we have to fight for our rights. We have to get very clever about how we document it and how we tell that story. And I will conclude my comments by saying leaders for many years ago recognized that Pew which is a major global think tank of information, <clears throat> had not done a, store, a, a, a survey on a Asian Americans in 10 plus years. And um, Nancy knows this. I just called them and I was like, why haven't you guys done a study on us? <laughs> what is the reason? There was a lot of different reasons, but we recognize as a grass tops organization that if we did not get data out about who we were, what we were thinking, how much economic power we had in the United States, where we were coming up short, but where we were batting strong and didn't educate the rest of the world in America about who we were, we were going to continue to be invisible. So that is one of the ways that we try to have some legacy building on making sure that we are not invisible as Americans. Can I add something real quick? Because what you said, I, I truly believe that that theme was the sort of um, thinking and ethos behind the founding for the Alliance for Asian American Justice. Because what we realized as lawyers, many of us, you know, representing the top corporations in the world, and then the leaders, the general counsels of these companies, is you're absolutely right, Lorna. If you walk out on the street, you are just an Asian American. And, you know, God bless those of us who we tried our best to climb the corporate ladder. But what we were seeing, at least personally, is that even though we were successful or tried to be so successful, many Asian Americans in the corporate world still feel invisible. And so I I've spoken about this before, but there is this poignancy where there is an invisibility in corporate America. And yet during COVID, you are completely, completely visible targets. What do you do with that? And targets, as Vin said, in such a terrible, terrible way with the hysteria. And, and so I think we have to play to our strengths. And we have to understand that critical mass matters, that we need allies. And look, I'm so happy to see so many non-Asian folks in the audience and in this district where it matters. We are one of the strongest, most lucrative, lucrative areas. We're our own economy, right? What we do, what we say matters here. And this is the district where there have been so many cases where Asian Americans' rights were vindicated. And so, I mean... I, I actually think when we talk about the stories, not only of like our hate crimes victims, part of it is the whole um, spectrum of Asian Americans in every single um, class strata. And if we can understand and see those connections and work together, that is, I think, where we end up being successful. Well, it's, yeah, you know, um, we, we have a staff that read through these, these reports and they're all horrifying. They're kids who are uh, harassed, they're seniors who are, are targeted. And I think that the, the important thing is to try and connect these dots into something productive. You know, when the um, Atlanta murders happen, and there's a confluence of gender, of class, and these are folks who work in, um, you know, uh, massage parlors, they also on, you know, a number of us, you know, like threw up, right? Because we had issued a report about the state of Georgia, you know, not uh, um, only I think a month or two beforehand, because there was a, sense, uh, a race for senator, U.S. senator, where the candidates were just going all out with the anti-China rhetoric, right? And so you could see this coming in the same way you could see this whole thing coming. And so we have to move on so many fronts. And I was so glad to the attorney um, Chu talked about the uh, equity budget 
Because a lot of it is how we build up our community capacity in multiple sectors, right? In our schools, in our businesses, in our museums, and, you know, in, in private industry, right? Um, that it's very difficult to solve this with like one solution, right? Uh, and so this idea of how do you build community power, how do you build community strength is, is critical to how we start to make progress. Um, that we don't have much time. Right. And like, you know, this idea that all well, history repeats itself. History is happening right now. Right? So, you know, we may be in a state where if you're a Chinese immigrant, you're still allowed to buy property. But there was a sensational uh, news piece, I think, uh, last year about, oh, Chinese companies are buying up property on the peninsula that's run by ABC7. Right. And they had, you know, congressmen talking about it. It turned out that it was actually, you know, some of our tech billionaires. We're looking, you know, the retraction doesn't matter. It's feeding this nonstop loop, right? And I think that this is where folks uh, in positions of power, ordinary people, have to start connecting the dots fast while also trying to do other common sense things, like make sure if you go to a sporting event or to a concert that there's real codes of conduct, right, that really govern how people are going to treat one another. You know, um, uh, public transit, with the incident reports that we've got, a large number of these things happen on the subway, on the buses, on BART, right? And we need to do better on how we actually make sure people are, are conducting themselves in a way that, you know, reduces hate. And, and I do want to say that it's also connected to other groups. Right? And so in the same way right now, there's a huge spike in anti-Semitism. There's a huge spike in anti-Muslim hate, right? These things are connected. And so if we have a, a society that condones this type of bigotry, and large part, oftentimes, just of things that are happening overseas, it just makes it harder and harder for all of us. So it's not enough only to speak out against hate, against, uh, against Asian Americans, but we have to be vigilant in speaking out against all these types of hate. Thank you, Vincent. And something you said earlier, I think bears repeating in that a lot of these incidents, and not just hate incidents, right, but discrimination generally often go on unreported in the Asian community. And as you said earlier, those acts don't necessarily rise to criminal liability. But to the extent we have information and we do have reporting, uh, Quinn, based on your work with the Alliance, what do you think is the role of litigation uh, in addressing the harms caused by, by anti-Asian hate or discrimination? Sure. Um, so when all of us, and, and I'll try to keep this brief because I we are the ones keeping us from the reception. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when when, <laughs> when we joined the alliance, it was always a vision of impact, community impacts, um, you know, uh, working within the community. And I think that was sort of the holistic view. It wasn't, I've all, I mean, you know, those of us who've done any type of social justice work, whether in the private sector, pro bono lawyers, whether we were at the Asian Law Caucus or whatnot. I mean, my view about litigation has always been that it's just one tool in the tool belt. You know, I, I was very blessed to have been a community organizer at the Asian Law Caucus, Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, before I went to law school. So I always had that view. You investigate first, you figure out what happens. And if the problems aren't going to be resolved, you, you, you file a suit. But when you file a suit, I mean, those of us who are experienced litigators, both on the plaintiffs and defense side, we know that could take years. So what is your goal, right? And our goal at the time was when we were seeing cases not be prosecuted, we did a few things. Our goal was one, to um, ensure widespread change, right? And two, so that our client, Mr. Lay, Vietnamese American, we represented a man who got beat up right before COVID. And he was like, I didn't even know that, like when I went to court, that my case got dismissed. I have no say in that. So I keep on experiencing these things again and again and again and again. And we were like, I am so sorry. I put on my Asian Law Caucus hat, you know, and my, my client, thankfully, Mr. Light, thank you. I know you'll watch this at some point, um, allowed us to speak about his case and to be this this example. And it was so painful. But, you know, we became sort of like, here's therapy. Let's go help you with this. Let's go figure out the problem. And so we filed suits ultimately after much investigation. And the goals were widespread change. So we did a federal lawsuit um, against the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. And we then filed a lawsuit against the, the defendants. Um, and we didn't want any money. I said, why do we want to do this? We want an apology. We do. And we have to figure out how to do this. 
as it turns out, and, you know, we we thought about how to do the lawsuit and, you know, I, I'm happy to post the complaints, but, you know, it was due process, um, clause, equal protection, Section 1983, and it was based on Marcy's Law, which says victims need to be told their rights. We did that because every time we went to court, it was very clear to us that the judges were actually really disturbed by this. OK, and so. We filed the suit federally on that basis. Um, we withdrew it without prejudice so that we can have serious conversations with the then district attorney. There was a recall so that became moot. But then we had very, very meaningful conversations with both district attorneys, um, administrations that ultimately led to what, um, you know, city attorney Chu was talking about in terms of citywide initiatives. And it's so meaningful, right? Like if that spurs the conversation, which was what we did that's extremely important. On the state court side, um, you know, we did that lawsuit with our our client, Applied Materials, one of the top semiconductor companies in the world. And it was an Asian American lawyer, one of our good friends, who said, we need to do something. So I said, let's let's litigate together. That's what we do. As a, So as a former litigator, he joined us and he's, you know, they're also a part of the alliance. We filed that suit and we followed through. We followed the defendants. We didn't want it to be punitive. We went to private mediation. Um, Judge James, who was formerly of the Northern District of California, we've been had, you know, we've had permission to talk about this. We got restorative justice. There was an apology. The case got dismissed. And through this process, and I hope Judge, Presiding Judge Masulo won't mind me sharing at a high level, we're working with the courts now on changing the local rules in terms of Marcy's law. And so I think for us, it was litigation is, to me, has always been the first kernel or, you know, one of the tools. It's not the only thing. You can't litigate for the sake of litigation. You have to see the entire picture and figure out where it is that there's impact. And then to take that, to tell the story of Asian Americans and to make people who are invisible, visible in a community that has traditionally been invisible in so many ways. And then to think through, how do you stop this from happening in the future? Quinn, can I just, I just wanted to ask a quick question not dissimilar to how parents have tried to pin on social media, right? This damage that has happened to their kids. And given, you know, uh, who is going to be the nominee of the Republican Party and his past comments, is any of this litigation something that can be built up to then point the blame and file a lawsuit from the original comments that started all of that? I mean, I wish that could be the case, maybe, but I just don't, I think it's hard, right? Like when you think about litigation and as a litigator, we think through claims that are viable and you begin at, you know, it's like small little things that spread. It's very grassroots, right? But we felt like San Francisco was the right time, the right place, the right courts. And, you know, I think the larger issues, I think it'll, the litigation sends a message, certainly, that that type of blatant discrimination is not tolerated. But I think for many of us who are litigators who, for instance, live in the community, some of the biggest impacts that you have begin with the regular person, right? Like I always think back to like the judge I clerked for. It's like, it's not a file, it's a person. And you think about that person, like our client who got restorative justice, who really helped us, you know, is going to help us change these local rules. And we're going to hope that other courts will step up. So the other judges and other counties that are watching will be having conversations soon. But I think for us, that's where we begin, Lorna. Like when we think about litigation and impact is that you begin with that person in that case, in that story, and then you build on that. Um, but it's a good thought. We should continue talking. Thank you, Clint and Lorna. And Vincent, really highlighting that this issue needs a multifaceted approach that is not just limited to litigation or, um, you know, criminal law, but really requires a community coalition building and effort to combat, effectively combat the effects of anti-Asian hate and discrimination. Um, I'm mindful of time, so I'll just ask one last question and then open it up to questions um, from the audience. But how can we get involved um, in, you know, in the spaces that you, that you, occupies leaders nationally, uh, statewide and locally, like how can we get involved in these efforts and how can we make a difference? I'd be shocked if, you know, anyone here, anyone watching from where they are, that there isn't something concrete, 
right? Because you do have this larger push against diversity, equity, inclusion efforts happening across the board in private sector. All of those need to be fought. You do have efforts to, you know, pull back the teaching of real history, including the history of people of color in our schools. We have efforts to try and improve how we think about public uh, safety, uh, whether that's making sure that there's true accountability or investments that actually can prevent things. So, you know, I think for us, at least, the, the part that maybe is not getting enough attention is that we do have to engage on these international issues as well and to make sure that the uh, debate is responsible and not reckless, right? Because there's a big opening for any politician, not just the ones running for president, to demagogue, you know, on the fear of non-white people and on the fear of Asians in particular. So stoptheblame.org is where you can sign up for our alerts that work uh, specifically on that. I, I would say that um, I, I'll do a little exercise really fast. If everyone pulls out their cell phone, if you can, just for a second, normally you aren't allowed to do that in a talk, but if everyone pulls out their cell phone and you open up a text window, like you're going to, to, you're going to open a new text. Um, if you type in 786-745, okay, and then just write hi, for example, as the message and send it. So if you wait a second, you should see a prompt coming up. Number? 786-745? Yeah. Six. One should have said, send, send, you know, like, you know, he bombs as well. <laughs> Scoop. Develop number. I was signed. Hold on a second. They might give you the wrong number. Sorry, 786748. I apologize. Okay. 786. 748. 786748. Send. And then it hit the pump. So, okay. So, right. So you want to say no, please, because no one's in physical danger here. But um, this tool, so uh, Lead Leaders Forum sort of is an incubator of next step innovation, if you will, in trying to, to do something. We were trying to build on the amazing work that Stop API Hate was doing because they were taking in reports on a computer online. But we thought, well, people are ordering Ubers on their phone and they're ordering food on their phone. So why can't they report a hate crime on their phone? And that will allow them to take a picture discreetly of somebody or whatnot. So you'll see the prompts. Um, and this is something that we've been incubating. There, there are issues with, you know, sort of rolling it out. But just to let you know, it's in different languages. Um, and it's a way to build on what Stop API Hate is doing because, as he pointed out, the real numbers are probably in the millions. And the way to get the government to pay attention is to say, wow, well, we have this documentation of millions of people that have reported a hate crime. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just actually have to be an Asian hate crime. It could actually be right. But it's all encrypted. Um, it's a short code. It lives on Twilio. But that's what we're thinking is the next push, right, is to sit there and bring in the numbers that Vincent is talking about. And then, I'm sorry, I believe that the federal government and other people are going to have to respond because how can they not when two million people are reporting that they're a victim of a hate crime? And we believe more resources and other things will go to that. So, you know, it's I think it's like innovative thinking. It's asking yourself you know, what can I do? How can I do something and pushing the envelope? That would be sort of my suggestion and answer to some folks. Thanks, Laura. Quinn? I'll, I mean, I guess hopefully we'll close because I know people are waiting. But I mean, I, look, I think every person needs to decide. I really appreciated, for instance, the bystander training. Um, and I still think it's so relevant. Every person needs to decide what they want to do meaningfully. It's so personal. And whether you're an ally to someone else or, you know, for lawyers, you will have a moment. You will. All of us. Are you going to speak up? Are you going to do something? You want to file a lawsuit? There's so many different ways to get involved. Certainly, the Alliance for Asian American Justice, we're very inclusive and have a very big umbrella. So anyone who wants to join us, we're always trying to think through what, what is happening next. I think the next phase is that our board members who are former prosecutors are trying to help provide training to um, other prosecutors' offices, given all of our learnings. 
and how to better prosecute cases because there's obviously limitations to the hate crimes statutes and what bias means. So I think we're in that chapter, but obviously we're always in the rapid response mode too. So I think there's so many different ways and I think we're so blessed to be in this district and this circuit as practicing lawyers and as community members. And and so look, we look forward to working together I mean, these panelists, right? But we're just a reflection of all of you. And so um, I'm so grateful to be here and I very much appreciate the time. Thank you all. Um, does anyone from the audience have any questions for our panelists? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Nita. Um, I am not a Great law or ever student. I'm actually um, I just graduated and I'm the Asian American Census Center. So, um, and um, in my experience planning and organizing it and working in the community, I'm noticing that in this history of oppression, um, there is kind of this, um, there's like you know, the oppression that happens and then there's a, there's a reaction from the community. Um, and I see that as it, as it repeats throughout history with different pieces that we refer for today. And my question is, um, you know, as we are continuing to mobilize and empower the people in our, you know, in high positions of power and, and people in this room, how do we also be proactive? Um, not only like within these spaces uh, to protect our community, because uh, many times when we're in these institutions, we don't notice the intricacies of white supremacy that happens, those loopholes after that happen. So my question is, how do we, how do they be more proactive in, in, in watching out for that, as well as encouraging the community also to this? Uh, the question is, how do you empower communities while with working within these spaces? To be more proactive. To be more proactive. Right. Well, I'll, I'll just say, you know, this is what affirmative action means. Affirmative action means like proactively doing things to redress historic and current systems you know, uh, uh, systemic discrimination. Now, it's been narrowed down in our discourse to just be about admissions and select universities. Um, but affirmative action is essentially that, right, that we do have to be proactive. And other forms of affirmative action, again, include DEI programs on the corporate side. It includes more expansive civil rights laws to catch people who are, say, you know, uh, speaking, uh, you know, non-English languages. It means taking so-called microaggressions seriously because if we can interrupt those things at that level, then they don't escalate into things that are even more difficult, and more violent, right? So, you know, I think ethnic studies has done wonders. Asian American studies has done wonders because it's given, you know, this current generation of activists the language to discuss, well, what is, what are we confronting? Is this model minority myth or is this perpetual foreigner or is this yellow peril fever? So I think these are all different ways of longer term, you know, and I think the it, it is really on this or transnational issues that become even more difficult. And clearly, when you see the conduct of many of our elected uh, members of Congress, they don't have a clue, right? They really don't. And, and I think it's very, very important to have representation that may have more nuanced views, but at least have the ability to interrogate, to make sure we're not moving down this path of, you know, of, of, of a reckless path of, of confrontation, right? And, you know, that's it. We talk about this, and immediately, I mean, I, I love the the slides that show some of the real racist and bigoted language. But you can go on Twitter any day and see that same thing directed at us, right? I think like, you know, so I think that this this type of you know need to be proactive includes trying to intervene in all of these things, the bystander trainings. You know, there's just so many small things that we can do to make each other safe. I, I would also, sorry, I would just add to that that. There's a, there's a lot of work being done, and what's important is to figure out where you fit in that. You know what I mean? Research different groups, figure out what they're doing, you know, right? Everybody, you know, has people that they need to help with, but finding your fit and your passion um, is really important because that's where you're going to go the farthest and I think feel the most empowered to be proactive. And I think one thing I'll add is, I mean, beyond just sort of like thinking about the policies and all, I mean, these are so important. I think the living the day-to-day -day life, and I think that's why when I talk about bystander training, I mean, for those of us who are in corporate America, you know, if you're a minority lawyer, a woman of color lawyer, any, you know, a woman, 
you are going to be underrepresented in the highest levels of power. So my view is when you are there, when you see people not being treated fairly, what do you do about it? Again, I think about it in the terms of impact litigation. You're gonna, I mean, for me, it's not like suing someone. It's about how do I make the greatest impact? And oftentimes it is a personal relationship and you have to make that. You have to find a way to bridge that chasm. Because you know what? Sometimes you may surprise you may be surprised, particularly working within institutions, that you will achieve the greatest by explaining something to someone. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times it's the limitations that people see because they're unaware. And I, I think having for me, like having that type of perspective, which is quite optimistic, but I do think that that is sometimes what makes the most difference. And we have to, as Lorna says, play to our strengths. Our numbers are large, right? And so when we were thinking about the alliance, it was that. It was like our clients are saying, you better do this. You need to do this. Obviously, I would have done it even though my, if my clients had saying that. Okay? But it was there was this alignment that I think that, you know, you have to sort of recognize on a day-to-day level too, beyond just like, and being proactive does mean that, is watching what is happening. If you're on the hiring committee, you will speak up, you know? I mean, by the time I was, I made partner, I was like, look, I don't want to be the only one. You better be lifting up others as you are moving along. And even that simple step, that person that you help will help someone else. And then you won't be the only one looking like you in that room. And when you have that critical mass, which is what we talk about, right? I mean, Ben knows in terms of the case law and stuff like that, that really matters. But that day-to-day living and perspective, it can be hard, right? And my, like, I know law students, I know people will watch this too. I do think that when you live that life, when you are that person and that minority and that woman of color, and you are the only one in that room, and, you know, you talk about all this stuff, how do you live and how you carry yourself? There are so many role models who live with grace and dignity, despite, and when I watch all of these cases that these professors tell us about, Who are you when you are that plaintiff? And like even with our plaintiff, right? And so for all of us who try to live that grace and live that way and think through how to make a a better profession and institution, I think we all win. So I, you know, for me, it's like little baby steps in addition to these important things that Lorna and Ben are talking about. Great. Thank you so much. I think that is all the time that we have. If you have questions, please feel free to speak to these speakers at the reception. Uh, But let's give uh, them a a round of applause for their expertise and sharing tonight. We're going to wrap this up now so you can go get your glass of wine and and eat food that's been catered by uh, Rory. And um, the takeaway tonight, learn, think, vote. Thank you to our panelists. Just remember on the ndhistoricalsociety.org website, We are going to edit, merge all the PowerPoints and videos, uh, and post everything, including the bios of our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much to everybody and to our sponsors. Everything's posted online. Thank you.